Joe is a partner in DeVore and DeMarco. Uh, he focuses on complex issues involving information privacy and security, theft of intellectual property, <clears throat> computer intrusions, and online fraud. He previously was with the United States Attorney's Office here in New York, and he is a sought after lecturer. He is also on the National Panel of Neutrals of the American Arbitration Association and um, Federal Arbitration. And we thank him for being here. Joe. Great, thanks very much. And uh, thank you, Arnie and Jane and Annabelle and everybody um, at the INBLF for supporting this Great Mind series. Uh, I've, I've seen some of the other presentations that I'm gonna do my best to, to clear the bar. I know it's a, it's a high hurdle, uh, as it should be, for a group of uh, such illustrious members as ours, but I really appreciate it. Um, what I'd like to spend maybe the next um, half hour or so uh, with, you, with you for discussion before we open it up to, to questions is really just to kind of touch on some of the issues that are in my wheelhouse. As, as many of you know, I practice in the area of data privacy and security and cybercrime prevention law full time. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years. Um, as many of you know, for the last 12 or 13 years, I've had my own boutique law firm in New York, I've been a chapter member for about 10 years, helping corporations, organizations, which include law firms, figure out issues related to data privacy and security compliance work, help them when issues arise that are data incidents, um, and also help them figure out how to avoid and respond to cybercrime, which affects every business or can affect every business in America and indeed around the world. Um, before starting my law firm for 10 years, I was an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York, where I led the cybercrime effort there, prosecute, investigating and prosecuting cyber criminals who hacked into organizations and their databases uh, of all flavors and stripes, including law firms. Um, and over the years have seen the field grow from a niche field really to a field that uh, encompasses issues of concern to every business in the world. When people ask me kind of who my prospective clients and my targets are, you know, perhaps unlike the Perlmans, which have a very specific group of, of companies, I'm much more kind of like along the Jane model, which is, you know, my prospective client is any company or organization that number one, has computers, and two, has data on those computers that they care about. And people say to me, well, that's every business in America. And I say, that's right. Um, because the reality of modern e-commerce and modern business is that uh, if you don't have computers and you don't have data on those computers, you're probably not in business. Um, just to kind of set the stage for, for, for my remarks, let me, just, let me just take a step back and give you um, a two minute version of the history of how it is that we got where we are in the area of data privacy and security. And then we'll just kind of jump right into how COVID and the whole work from home phenomenon explosion has affected that. You know, a lot of times I've, I'm asked by, by clients or peers or other lawyers, you know, how is it that we got here? Why is it that we live in a world where you know, we have hackers and data breaches reported every day in the news and clients, you know, uh, chomping at our heels to get our data privacy and security practices up to snuff as, as service providers to them. And the answer is actually, it's very simple. Um, you know, with the dramatic rise in e-commerce at the turn of the last century, um, there was a dramatic spike in cybercrime. You know, cyber criminals figured out that one way to make money or engage in other wrongdoing was to move their conduct from the physical world onto the di into the digital world. And that happened both in the fraud context, it happened in the, in the um, copyright infringement and data piracy context, it happened in the theft of trade seeker context, it happened in the theft of personally identifiable information. You know, I remember um, vividly when the US attorney in, uh, it was 2002, gave a press conference in our office to announce the then largest um, identity theft case prosecuted by any prosecutor in America. Um, and it involved you know, a number of corrupt people working at a credit agency who had stolen and sold to identity thieves the whopping number, I hope everyone is sitting down, uh, of 30,000 personal identification uh, records. 
Now, at the time, 30,000 personal IDs and stolen IDs was a huge number, so huge that the United States attorney convened a press conference to announce the arrest of the perpetrators involved in that. Today, a 30,000 person ID theft case, you know, that's kind of like barely newsworthy. Uh, you know, unless you get into the hundreds of thousands or millions of people like the Yahoo breach or the OPM breach, um, it's not going to even make the evening news. But the rise in cybercrime led to two very important developments in the law, um, one of which has almost no relevance to our chat today, uh, but I'll mention it anyway. It led to the dramatic increase in penalties for cybercrime offenses. So that today, if you are convicted of a criminal cybercrime offense in the United States, you face a lot more jail time than you did in, let's say, 1996. Congress and state legisl legislatures responded to the rise in cybercrime by upping the penalties for cybercrime offenses. They also did one other thing, and this is of crucial importance. They started to impose upon entities that collect and aggregate personally identifiable information, bank account information, credit card information, health information. They started to impose on those organizations obligations to secure that information. And so today, if you are a business that collects personal information, name, address, social security number, bank account information, or health information uh, on people in the United States and internationally, we'll put, put aside GDPR issues, I don't see too many uh, overseas lawyers on, but I can address that if people want. But today, if you're a business, and law firms shockingly are businesses, regulated by state attorney generals and the Federal Trade Commission, and you collect and maintain personal information, you have an obligation to secure that information so that it's not lost, stolen, or abused. That's crucially important. Um, what that means is you have affirmative duties and you'll get an article that's in draft format on specific New York State requirements that apply to you if you have even a single New Yorker's personal identification in your databases, you have an obligation to secure that. But they did more. They didn't stop there. They also required organizations that have personal information, if they lose that information, to report that information, the loss, to affected individuals, and to report it oftentimes to state attorney generals. Another thing happened too. With the confluence of those two developments, plaintiffs class action lawyers realized that a new form of revenue for them was to bring class action lawsuits against organizations that had data security incidents that involved the loss of personal identifiable information for negligence, fraud, breach of fiduciary duty, and related common law causes of action. That's why we are where we are today. That's why when Target, Home Depot, OPM, anyone else um, that runs a business has a data breach, they're required to notify victims, required to notify the attorney generals and why it's on the front page or sometimes second or third page of a major newspaper. That's why many law firms have developed data privacy and security practices. Um, I will tell you from having worked with law, law firms and lawyers, um, you know, they are not, let's just say, the earliest of adopters when it comes to technology. And so getting these issues right at law firms is not always easy, but it is doable. It is doable, particularly doable for small law firms for reasons I'll describe in a moment. Um, it's also the case that if your law firm here does not have a written information security policy, a magna carta, if you will, of how you collect, maintain, secure, and dispose of personal information, you're probably not in compliance with New York law and the law of the state in which you practice. Um, it's also the case if you don't have a written incident response plan, you're also not in compliance with the law. And so if any of you are interested in the, talking about those subjects further or doing a deeper dive, I'm happy to do that. Again, I'm circulating an article to the group on that subject, which will give you some high level guidance, okay? Um, so with that in mind, let me just kind of spend a few minutes on um, the latest and greatest. The latest and greatest is that never, never um, before have companies and organizations, including law firms, including your clients, faced challenges um, that we're facing today as it relates to data privacy and security. Uh, and one of the biggest reasons for that is because of the massive shift which we've seen over the last few months um, from an office environment or mostly office environment 
to a mostly or sometimes exclusively work from home environment. You know, in my business, we talk about cyber risk uh, and cyber vulnerabilities, often starting with the concept of an attack surface, right? What does the attack surface of your organization look like? How big is your attack surface? If you're one person working on one computer, your attack surface is relatively small. It's you and that computer. If you're a 20 person law firm, your attack surface is bigger. If you're in more than one office, your attack surface is bigger than if you're in one law office. If you have a lot of seasonal employees, interns or externs coming, as opposed to a very stable workforce, your attack surface is larger. Well, if you think about it, for a small or medium-sized law firm, really anyone except a solo practitioner who only worked out of their home, if a lot of your employees have now gone from working in the office most of the time to working from home most of the time, the attack surface of your organization, the, the places that are exposed to attack by cyber criminals has expanded dramatically, right? Because you've gone from, let's say, at a eight office from eight computers now to 16 or more computers, because it's quite possible that your employees working from home are working on multiple devices. Now, I grant you, some of you that service highly regulated clients in banking, finance, defense, power generation, you may have the same type of cybersecurity protections at your home office that you do at your main office. In fact, some of you may have had um, you know, offices literally configured to your client standards, both in your office and at your homes. Um, if that's the case, this lecture is probably not for you. But if that's not the case, then I would advise you to pay attention to a number of very important risks. Because not only has your attack surface grown, you have a lot more people working on a lot more devices. The vulnerabilities associated with those devices, particularly if they are not centrally managed by competent firm IT, poses a very serious risk to your business. And there's nothing worse than having to go to a client and say to them, I'm sorry, I lost your data, right? Or I'm sorry, I've had an incident and it might have affected your data. And by the way, even if all the laws I just mentioned were repealed tomorrow, you probably still have ethical duties under the canons of professional responsibility to have that awful conversation with your client, even if all those laws were passed, because we're all bound by ethical duties of technological competence, fiduciary duties of loyalty, duties to safeguard our client's property, and duties of candor when property has been subject to lost, loss, theft, or abuse. So what are, in addition to the large attack surfaces, some of those risks? Well, I'll start with kind of one of the most obvious ones, which is if your employees are not working on firm managed devices, then they're probably working from personal devices. And that can be problematic in a number of respects. First of all, they might not be working from devices which are properly managed and secured. I mean, I've had situations where clients, I'm just turning off my printer, um, where clients have had to work on family devices that are maybe not patched. Trust me, there's nothing more um, risky than having your legal work be done on your son or daughter's you know, circa 2005 gateway laptop that hasn't been patched since 2008 and for which patches are not available. That's problematic, right? So the most, one of the most important things is to be sure that you and your employees are working on centrally managed dev devices, um, or if you're working on personal devices that they're running up-to-date anti-malware, antivirus systems. Another area of real vul vulnerability is the issue of Kind of what I call the well-intentioned uh, workarounds. Um, for some people, until they're you know up and running at home in the way that they should be, um, oftentimes they're working um, in ways that are inherently insecure. They might, for example, um, be forwarding firm emails or client documents to their webmail account, to their Yahoo account, to their Gmail account. Worse still, that might be a shared account with a spouse or with children. Worse still, it might not have a robust password. 
Worse still, it might not be secured by multi-factor authentication. All of those things are highly problematic. And they're problematic because a lot of those um, devices have been, unfortunately, compromised in different ways by wrongdoers who have access to that data. That's a problem. We helped a client over this past summer at a major law firm, and by the way, even major law firms struggle with this and they have different issues. We helped a client this past summer who had retained an Amlaw 50 law firm in a bet the company, high stakes, high profile litigation, and came to learn that critical deposition outlines, critical trial plan documents, and critical strategy documents had found their way into the other side's possession. We spent a good part of last summer working to figure out how that happened. One of the ways it may have happened, and we never got to the bottom of it, we gave, we gave the, the client, you know, kind of a ranked list of, of most likely to least likely scenarios, but one of the most likely scenarios was that um, one of the partners, the head of the litigation department, um, you know, person my age, of reasonable technical sophistication um, had decided to defeat the firm's cybersecurity protections um, for convenience sake and send some of the documents that wound up in the other side's hands to his Yahoo account. It didn't take us long to find his Yahoo password on a list of stolen passwords, you know, that, that are tracked by databases which track these things. So one way that, you know, the compromise could have happened was that, you know, again, someone was just in his, uh, in his email account, maybe specifically for this purpose, or maybe it was a crime of opportunity, but found the documents uh, and, and conveyed them to the other side. That is one possibility. And that is a workaround that I see uh, a lot of times people engaging in, which should not be engaging. You really should only be working on your firm accounts. Um, if you VPN, if you, if you access your firm server, it should be through a VPN connection. Um, and if you're storing documents in the cloud, it should be to a cloud platform that is secured with a robust password, multi-factor authentication, uh, and other protections offered by the platform. You know, it's very rare that these platforms, if you're using platforms, fail. It's much more likely that, you know, that it's pilot error, the failure of the attorney to deploy the security configurations that are available or to use robust uh, access credentials. That's usually where we see the failures. So again, as you think about, you know, your team working from home, and, and that includes administrative personnel, it includes interns, externs, law clerks, you know, the, the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle. As you think of, wh of them working from home, ask yourself the question, you know, what devices are they on? Um, how are they accessing the firm server if they're accessing the firm server or the firm's cl cloud platform? Um, how is their Wi-Fi protected? Um, you know, again, another, another potential way in which this particular partner was compromised was, you know, he used the Wi-Fi uh, at JFK Airport in the, um, in the British, uh, British Airways um, first class lounge. Now, it's quite possible he actually was on the Wi-Fi supported by the British Airways first class terminal lounge. It's also possible he was on a rogue network. Um, people will oftentimes see popping up on their devices invitation to join open unsecured networks that are often deceptively named by wrongdoers to try and capture that traffic. So again, be always sure that you're on a Wi-Fi device that you, a Wi-Fi connection that you know is authentic and that is secured. And if you have a home router, as many of you do, if it's not feasible to connect by ethernet to a hardwired connection, um, make sure that your router, uh, number one, does not have the factory default password that you, you know, put on, in place a robust password and that it's updated with security patches, which are probably pushed out by your cable provider. And that is information you can get from your cable provider. Um, so again, a kind of common area where we see vulnerabilities that are associated with, with working from home. Um, you know, there are a lot of questions that have come up about Zoom and um, vulnerabilities associated with Zoom. I'm not going to go through all of those there. There's a lot of rich public literature on that. Um, and Zoom has upped its security game, as have other platforms. But I will leave you with kind of one thought on the Zoom and video conference front. Um, which is to say the following, and, and, and you know, it sounds so obvious, I don't even know there qualifies for a great minds lecture, but sometimes, sometimes a, you know, a great mind is just someone who restates common sense, which, which is the following. You know, just because you have the ability to have a Zoom video conference doesn't mean that you 
must have a Zoom video conference. Now, there are times when you need to share screens, whiteboard, all that jazz. I get all that. Uh, there's sometimes you just want to, you know, particularly maybe for client development reasons, it's nice to see your client. I mean, I've used Zoom for checking calls with clients. I've used Zoom calls for, you know, casual happy hour beers as, as we have on this as well. Um, you know, um, there's certainly great enjoyment in, you know, in, in, in seeing Lewis's red wall, which, you know, catches my attention every time I see it. Uh, and the hanging above the red wall, which to me looks like, you know, framed old uh, cigar box artwork, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, I take great psychic pleasure in that, right? But if I'm on a call talking about, you know, renegotiating the ground lease at 30 Rock, you know, I don't know that I need, you know, to be on a video call with Lewis. We might actually be able to do that through old fashioned, you know, telephone calls. Uh, and dare I say on an old fashioned landline because there are vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities associated um, even with cordless phones. So I would say, you know, the point I would leave you with on the Zoom front, which is a, is a hot front, is, you know, just understand that for a lot of communications, we don't need um, to use the technologies that are out there and available. And, and if you do, obviously, then probably best to have a conversation about, about that. Um, so I think those are kind of some of the highest level issues that I've seen. You know, I will say this, you know, we have only scratched the surface as a society, as a culture, um, as a profession, we've only scratched the surface as to how the work from home phenomenon is going to be affecting our work uh, over the next, you know, five to 10 years. You know, it used to be, you know, there was a, a neat divide between the office environment and the home environment, right? You know, people would, would go to work, they'd come home, they'd leave their work, work at work, they'd leave their home life at home that started to deteriorate right with the rise in teleconferencing the rise in email and ultimately what really you know made it go fast was the connectivity and the power of of these devices which essentially mean that you can for better and worse work 24 7. um but what we're really seeing now is not just the blurring of the line between work environment and home environment we're really seeing the obliteration of that line um, that's going to have profound consequences down the road. It's going to have profound consequences on labor law, on criminal law, uh, on antitrust law, on really every law that every one of us touch. Um, and it's already had effects on, um, on my area of law. One of the questions I got maybe a month or so into this, maybe even less than that, about two weeks into this, it was maybe late March, was from a hedge fund client that I do a lot of work for here in Connecticut, one of the, one of the most prominent hedge funds in the world. Um, Basically, they said to me, look, we're really concerned about the loss of our secret sauce IP. You know, we spend millions, billions of dollars on developing trading algorithms that are unbelievably sophisticated, that our competitors would love to get their hands on, uh, and that departing employees would love to get their hands on, because the barriers to entry in our field are, are relatively low. You know, we have everyone working at home now. They're working on home managed devices um, as part of the consents that they signed when they joined the company, when they got the devices, and annually when they received information privacy and security training, they consented to our examination remotely of the devices, including all the features and capabilities of the devices that are our devices that we gave them to work at home. They consented to that without any notice. The question we have for you though, Joe, is to help us think through the criminal and civil legal issues associated with um, with us potentially using that authority to the maximum of our technical ability. Again, all the consents were signed off on, right? Um, and what they wanted to know was, what were the civil and criminal law implications of us, for example, just, you know, without any notice, turning on the laptop cameras, just to see whether or not they had someone from a competitor by their side when they were accessing the firm networks remotely or whether it was a spouse or some other person not authorized to see that information and they just wanted to surreptitiously without any transparency to the employee as to that particular event turn on the firm cameras the cameras of the laptops and record what they saw or and or turn on the microphone and speakers um actually just the the microphone not the speakers so they could listen in they just want to listen in you know 
Um, that question really would not have come up pre-COVID um, because the amount of time people were spending working from home was minuscule as compared to working from home. Um, that's a really tough question to answer. And I'd venture to say it implicates labor law. Uh, it implicates uh, a host of other laws besides my area of the law. And of course, I was very careful just to stay within my wheelhouse. Unfortunately, they had existing labor council, so I couldn't refer any of our members to them. Um, but it was, it was the first or second thought that went through my mind. Um, but that's a really interesting question, you know, and, and what are the societal implications of that? Again, even where the employees have specifically consented. Um, but we're going to see a range of those kind of questions come up in ways foreseen and unforeseen. There could be tax law questions that come up. I mean, you know, already my accountant is saying to me, you know, look, Joe, if you've been working in Connecticut for three months, you know, maybe we don't have to pay New York state taxes on all that income. You know, and there once was a time when Connecticut had no income tax. Um, those days are over, but its income tax is still a little bit less than New York's. Um, and that's something to consider. So I venture to say, I leave it to all of you, um, maybe for future presentations to ponder those issues. Um, it's already affecting the law of data privacy and security. Um, I would really ask yourself those two fundamental questions, which I started, which is one is, am I in compliance with existing laws? Do I have the existing documentation, written information security policy, incident response plan that I need in case, God forbid, something happens? That's the first thing a regulator is going to ask for. And by the way, you may have to actually have to supply it to a prospective client at some point. And there's nothing worse than when you're asked for that document to say to the client, uh, can we get back to you on that, right? Much better to just hit send um, and keep your, keep, you know, and stay in the game. And then secondly, think of your home network, think of how your employees are working from home and just go through the risks that I've articulated as well as that are articulated on the article that's on the INVLF website. Um, talk to your outside technical provider and go through those risks and see if you're doing almost as good or as good as you possibly can under the circumstances relative to how you manage these issues uh, from a, an office environment. And again, I'm assuming that the audience here is self-selecting, that you've mastered those issues uh, from a home environment or your firms have you know, forced you to because your clients have forced you to. Um, but I think you know, those are kind of the two most important things I would, I would leave you with. Um, and now with you know, Jane and, and Arnie's and Annabelle's permission, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to, to questions um, and provide you with whatever guidance and answers I can. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, um, I, I want to say that uh, right off the bat, not only have you um, met the bar, but you've now raised the bar for future uh, presentations. I, I, I think this is really fabulous. And, and the fact that you uh, both extemporized and didn't even have a uh, PowerPoint presentation as part of it. Uh, sort of adds, adds a level of uh, uh, the personalness to the, if that's the right word, to, to the presentation. Um, one thing you mentioned, and I want to um, get assistance on this, where you said when you work in your office, you've got one computer um, sitting there, uh, and, and, that, and that's the device you need to worry about. But as you pointed out, everybody's got an iPhone. Uh, or the equivalent, which constitutes a second device. Sure. What are the uh, recommendations that you've got? Uh, because we all spend between email and whether it's access to the office uh, through VPNs or other systems, we've got access to that. What are the security issues that we need to think about? And I'll sure. add one of the people I invited uh, to this presentation is Jerome, who is our, Jerome Smith, who's our uh, IT uh, outside specialist uh, help us um, deal with with these issues, and and he has access to our um, uh, office network, so he can sort of take over my computer and and sort of clean things up and and patch up the securities. But on the iPhone, we've never done that, and I just want to know your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, first of all, you know, just right off the bat, you know, I'm a lawyer, not a technologist, so you know, we'll defer to the details uh, to folks like you know. A drone whose name I see. Um, but at the highest level, you know, it's, it's kind of relatively rare we see vulnerabilities or, or data incidents uh, triggered by, um, by, by uh, iPhone or iPad or similar devices, apart from the loss of the device. Like if you lose it and you have no password, um, you know, if you have no password on your device, uh, and some people do still, believe it or not, 
um, and you don't have the ability to remotely wipe it or track it, um, you know, there's not much I can do to help you there, okay? Um, but assuming that you at least have a password, remote wipe, remote beacon, track, um, you know, you're, you're in pretty good shape. Um, what I would suggest is, you know, that you are fastidious about updating the um, operating system, you know, and security patches associated with the operating system of the device. And you get those reminders <laughs> from Apple if it's an iPhone regularly. Um, and then also, you know, that you update the apps. Um, and then you'd be very cautious about what apps you use and what data you keep on the device apart from email. Um, if you are downloading documents onto the device or you're using apps, um, you may be at the, you know, at the um, mercy of the security of those apps. Um, so again, depending on how you use your device, there may be additional security you need to put in place. Um, again, I always would enable two-factor authentication wherever possible as to apps and other types of devices. Um, but aside from that, um, you know, it's really rare that I see the compromise of, of, a, of a device through, through um, you know, a, a device like an iPhone or an iPad. But those are some of the things that I think are important on that front. And then, of course, again, if you're on the Wi-Fi, make sure you know what Wi-Fi you're on. Again, less vulnerabilities if you're on the cell phone network than if you're on Wi-Fi. But a lot of people just switch back and forth and they automatically join networks that they don't know about. Um, those are of concern to me. I hope that helps. Uh, this is Larry Edmer, Washington. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm a solo practitioner, so I do not have a, an in-house IT department. When something goes wrong with, uh, I, and I, have Dell, I haven't had Dell computers, so when something goes wrong, um, I call Dell tech, tech support, and I normally speak with someone far away, often in India or the Philippines, sometimes in South America. They're very helpful, mm -hmm. uh, but almost always they want to do a screen share. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure these are, um, you know, Dell employees who I'm speaking with. And sometimes there are other issues with other companies. Are there any precautions that should be taken when an outside tech support person wants to do a screen share other than the obvious, which is, you know, closing other programs that might be running. Yeah, I'm, you know, you know, actually if, if Jerome's on the line, I'm curious to have his thoughts on that. Cause, cause from my vantage point, if you are 100% sure that you are 100%, you know, on the line with Dell, you know, then, then to, to my mind, the odds are, are relatively low that that's gonna trigger security vulnerability. And I think you've triggered, you know, the one, the one thing that's most important. The other thing you might want to do is, you know, you might want to, um, uh, you might want to put in place um, separate logons to certain databases. So, for example, you might have, let's say, client. Like, I'm sure you do have client files, um, or you may have client files stored locally. What you may want to do is I, I store them in Dell's, you know, uh, OneDrive I, iCloud. Okay, so then you may want to close that and may want to have a separate and unique password. So that when the person is on, the person couldn't just click on your Dell Cloud, you know, icon and see your client data. That's something you may want to do um, with again a different password, unless of course they need to get into your um, your cloud portal. But I think the odds of, of of an incident happening in you know as a result of a corrupt or rogue vetted Dell tech support person. I mean, in 20 years, I've never seen it. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but Again, in 20 years of doing this, I've never seen a vulnerability or an incident happen that way. So I, I what think about, that, well, What about VPNs? Do you, is that a gimmick or is that something you encourage? You no, know, VPNs are important if you're logging into from your computer to another computer. Um, but just remember, a VPN is just securing the tunnel, the communication tunnel. So if you're, the server you're, you're VPNing into is compromised or your laptop or desktop is compromised, having a secure tunnel really offers no protection at all. Thank what do you. you see is the difference between a VPN and something like LogMeIn? Well, LogMeIn is a VPN. It's a brand oh, of okay. yeah, LogMeIn, Citrix, uh, I think WebEx, uh, TeamViewer, GoToMyPC. Th that, those are brands of, com those are companies which provide VPN connectivity. Didn't realize that. Thank you. But just remember, well, have two-factor two authentication enabled, right? So that mm -hmm. when you do go to LogMeIn, it's not just your username and password that gets you in. Also, i um, just curious, on the uh, litigation you were involved in, what happened to the receiving law firm? Well, that was very interesting. Oh, by the way, there was a third way that that vulnerability could have happened, and I'm glad you mentioned it because it touches on another important issue. So 
you know, many, many people, not the people who work from home all the time, but people who come home and are going to go back, um, be very mindful of kind of, you know, just what you bring back to the office, what you print out, and particularly your use of removable storage devices like thumb drives. You know, a lot of people are printing out work documents at home, marking them up, scanning them, putting them aside. Those should not go out in the home trash, right? You should be putting those in a dedicated red weld that says on it, you know, don't not trash, you know, or to shred bin, and then either shred that periodically at your home crosscut shredder, or if you don't have one, bring it back to the office when you go back and put it through a crosscut shredder. Um, the other thing too are thumb drives, right? I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that I open up my, you know, 11 year old daughter's, you know, school bag and there are thumb drives that I've never seen in there. The last thing I will ever do is plug that in because for all I know, that's some other mom or dad's thumb drive that went into their son or daughter's backpack and got commingled in the school. Not that that happens now because no one's going to school, but you know, you don't want to be having a bunch of work-related thumb drives laying around the house that get thrown into some kid's book bag and get plugged in by some other lawyer, uh, you know, across town or worse, right? So I would say, you know, um, just the custodian, custodianship, good custodianship over physical documents is important. But I, I think I, 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 that answer, I forgot your question, Jane, I'm sorry. What uh, happened to the receiving welfare? Oh, the, the receiving welfare, all right, the third way, right? So that was, one way was hapless attorney using the webmail account, hapless attorney using uh, rogue Wi-Fi. Third way was, as an added kind of belt and suspenders workaround in case he wasn't able to access the internet and get to the copy of the document that he shouldn't have sent to his Yahoo account. He also sent it to, had his firm's London office printed out and then messenger it to the hotel he was staying at and it never arrived. Um, a hotel which happens to be owned reportedly by the Russian mafia. So, you know, just be careful with print out, printed out documents as well, because if you send something to someone to print it out, you lose custody and control over it. Um, and even though the hotel logged it in uh, at the concierge's desk, it never made it to him. So that was the third way that it could have been compromised. But was the law firm sanctioned or? No, there's active litigation on the question. The law firm um, maintains, the other side law firm maintains that they received it from an anonymous whistleblower. Oh, right. Okay. And Joseph, I'll... oh, may I ask a question? I have, um, I'm calling you from San Francisco, so I had to, it's early here, I had to go get another cup of coffee. So I hope I didn't miss this part of your presentation. But um, I had sort of an aha moment when you were talking about how the failures usually come more from employees not following the systems than necessarily some of the systems that are employed. And I feel like I'm always running around. I have Emily Fodiati on, our, on this call too, and she's our operations manager and oversees our tech. Um, and I'm always sort of running around trying to figure out what's the best technology to keep us secure um, and constantly harassing her with that question. But I realized that one of our challenges is having our employees follow our policies. And I am wondering if you, um, you have a recommendation as far as um, putting policies like in the employee handbook or and do you have a sample sort of tech policy that you would point us to, to as a starting point, um, especially now that everybody is working from home? Sure. So, um, so there are two aspects to your question. One is where do you put it? Um, and yeah, a logical place to put it is in the employee handbook. Um, you know, you should all have banners on your computer, log on banners, which remind people of those policies. Um, you're, yeah. You should also do training. Um, in terms of template, you know, WISPs or incident response plans or work from home policies, you know, we have some templates, but, you know, in the end, unless you're going through a box checking exercise, if you really want to get at, you know, actual security and meaningful policies, it really requires just some customization. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, um, I'm curious as to whether you think that um, data that's held by like a, a ransomware attack um, would be considered a data breach? Possibly. So that's mm -hmm. a very interesting question. We actually helped a company, was it a law firm? I can't remember what it was a law firm, but we recently helped a company in the last three months or six months um, with that question. So some ransomware will simply make data unavailable. Right. 
other ransomware will exfiltrate the data and make it unavailable. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have to go through a somewhat refined analysis and sometimes you're never 100% sure, yeah. but in order to call the ball as to whether or not you have a reportable data breach as a result of, an, of a ransomware incident or not, um, it does require a fairly fact-specific investigation. We look at the type of ransomware deployed, we look at the nature of the data, we look at the nature of the incident, um, and we, you know, we use our 20 years plus, my team and I, our 20 years plus experience to basically, you know, help, help the client make a judgment call on that question. And, and usually it is a judgment call. Thank you. Joe, I have a question. First, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I actually have two questions. The first is, what is, do you recommend cybersecurity insurance for law firms? My first question. Sure, possibly. It depends on, again, the size of your firm, the nature of the data that you hold, the risks, you know, that you might face. Um, you know, look, for a law firm that doesn't have much personally identifiable information, um, you know, what they probably need insurance for is ransomware, you know, the cost of either paying the ransom or rebuilding the system. Um, and perhaps, you know, um, uh, in addition to ransomware, just maybe business interruption insurance. Uh, what they also probably need is insurance that will cover, and it's typically not covered in insurance policies, and we haven't talked about it, but business email compromises resulting in fraudulent wire transfers. So, you know, as you all know, you know, the hackers are in our systems, they're watching deal flow. And if you're a trust and estates attorney, a real estate attorney, any attorney that moves money in large quantities, um, you know, oftentimes you will be, um, not often, but it can happen that you're the victim of a business email compromise where someone inserts himself into the conversation and has you send money to, you know, to a different place. And that's, of course, the bad guys. Um, that's easily preventable, quite, quite frankly, by, you know, by simply confirming through non-electronic means those change instructions, right? Getting on the telephone, the old fashioned telephone or a Zoom call and just, you know, say, or face-to-face -face meeting and say, hey, do you really want us to change the bank account? Uh, and that, that's the, the simplest way of preventing that kind of fraud. Um, but it can also be insured to a degree. Um, typically you should talk to your broker. It's not gonna be in a cyber policy. It may be in a crime or fraud policy. Um, but that is insurance that, you know, again, depending on the nature of your practice, you might wanna have. I mean. You know, Arnie, for, for your, Ms. Lusker, for your practice, you know, copyright and IP, I could imagine some things that you'd want and some things that you wouldn't want. Um, but I think it's worth exploring the issue with your broker. Typically, it's not covered by your professional responsibility insurance either, in case you were wondering. Okay. And, and one unrelated question. Um, if you can think back to the days when we used to travel, um, what guidelines, well, put it this way, would you use a hotel business center computer? Never. Never. Okay. And how about the the Wi-Fi in your room, hotel room? Uh, almost never. But if I had to, maybe um, I would try and ride on my on the cell local. Well, the locals, you know, that the in country cellular network. And and yes, that can be expensive. Or or I would take my you know encrypt, hard drive encrypted computer with me without much other data on it. So like almost like a travel laptop, and from the hotel would VPN in through an ethernet cable, VPN in to, or through or through the cell network, would VPN in to the home office that way. I would not be, um, I try and really try and stay off hotel Wi-Fi and I never use hotel business centers. I mean, except to check the weather. You know. Thank you. <laughs> and the same with any kind of working in a cafe or anything like that. I think that working from home with our employees, that might be a little bit of a challenge. It can be, although no one's really traveling now. So, you know, right yeah. now you probably yeah. can, is, is also now is a good time to do training. You know, people have the time and, you know, people I think generally welcome this kind of training because it also helps protect them in their personal life. I mean, all the yeah. tips you give employees, everything I've just said helps them in their personal life. Yeah. I don't know if other firms have had this experience, but we've had a lot of, um, I don't know, Emily, what do you call it? Phishing, where they reach out to our employees and say, we need you to, you know, go to the store and buy these things for the client and send these gift cards here, you know. Yeah. And some of them are easy to spot, but I will tell you, you know, look, I, I, 
I was a prosecutor during 9-11, and I recall vividly the spike in 9-11 related charity frauds after 9-11, and those cases yeah. were prosecuted, and the people that perpetrated those crimes got long jail sentences. I was in private practice during Superstorm Sandy, um, and I remember following Superstorm Sandy, the rise in Superstorm Sandy related charity frauds, yeah. uh, and people that were prosecuted for that got long jail times. We're seeing the same spike now as it relates to COVID or work from home, or I mean, we've even seen, you know, people pretending to be members of the firm's IT department, sending recommendations on how to work securely from home, which are really, you know, phishing links. So, you know, I think there the, the, the watchword is, you know, just train, 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 really convey to your employees that if they have any suspicions whatsoever about an email before they click mm -hmm. on the link or open the attachment, you know, call through a verified number, the sender and ask them, is, is it legitimate? Um, and I would also say that if they, um, if you have the ability to forward these emails to, you know, to someone like Jerome, who can open it in a sandbox environment and tell you if it's, you know, fraud or not, that's a good thing too. And I mean, just there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It usually can be done pretty quickly. It happened to me two days ago. I got an email out of the blue at, from someone I'd never met before. And I had no expectation this was coming in. Um, someone looking for assistance. And before I opened anything, I sent it to my um, IT service provider and said, you know, I just have a bad feeling about this. Can you open it up in a controlled environment? And he did. He said, no, Joe, it looks like you have an actual new client that wants to come in. To come in. I, you know, I wrote back and, you know, I also had, I, true story, I had an established client, one of my best clients say that always mailed me paper checks. I got an email from an accounts payable person at the company that I'd never worked with say to me, we're moving to an ACH environment. Could we have all your bank account information so we can pay you? And um, I did two things. One is I, I forwarded the email to the head of IT at the client who I deal with regularly. And I said, is this legit? Um, and he took me a while for him to get back to me. So I just, you know, I called the main number and asked the operator to connect me to that person, left a message on that person's voicemail to give me a call. That person did. Um, so at least I knew I was talking to that person. I said, did you just send me an email about ACH, you know, transfer information? She said, yes. And then because I'm so paranoid, I asked her a couple of confirmatory questions like, you know, oh, when was the last time you were in the building? And she said, oh, it was in March. And I said, oh, you know, how are those plants doing? You know, those plants in the corner. And she said, we don't have plants. I said, good, that's the right answer. But that's success. Joe, I wanted to uh, follow up on Susan's first question um, and your answer to it. Um, and that was about cybersecurity insurance. Right. And I think part of your answer said it depended on the size of the firm. Yeah. So I've had cybersecurity insurance for my solo practice for the past four years. Am I wasting my money? No, but you'll probably never use it. Right. I, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. And we have fire and flood. You know, we've never used fire insurance. Our house has never burned down, but we have it. How does how does the insurance work? I'm curious. I didn't I didn't realize this was a problem. Well, there are different kinds of insurance. Some will some is a form of business interruption insurance, so they'll pay to help you rebuild your network after it's been cyber destroyed. Some of it is essentially um, breach response insurance. It'll help you pay for notifications to clients and attorney generals if you lose their information. Some of it is ransomware insurance. They'll help you pay the extortion. And some of it is business email compromise. If you send money or to where it shouldn't go, they'll help you they'll reimburse you for that. So there are different flavors. Joe, it's Arnie again. Uh, for firms of 10 and under, what are the three most important things we should think about for cybersecurity? Sure, it's a great question. Um, make sure that your laptops uh, are encrypted at the hard drive level and that they and all your computers are running up-to-date antivirus, anti-malware, and anti-spam programs. I would say that's number one. I would say number two, don't ever open a suspicious email, click on a suspicious link, or open a suspicious attachment. And three would be, hmm, you know, there'd be a tie. Can I, can I, can I, get, can I give you five instead of three? Four, I get one more, all right. So then the next one would be don't use removable storage devices like thumb drives or allow them to be used in your, in your firm. Disable the ports at the operating system level. And then one more, um, 
let's say, you know, train your employees. Yeah, train your employees. Thank you. <laughs> Everything I've said on the uh, work from home environment, by the way, is in the article that um, that's already on the website. So it goes into more detail. One last thing, one practice point or two, and if anyone wants this, please let me know is, you know, I, how do you deal with clients? I always put in my engagement agreement a paragraph which says at the end, you know, in connection with our provision of legal services to you, we are going to be using, um, you know, standard email, standard telephones, including cordless phones, and standard cloud storage service providers. Um, you know, while any of these might be, you know, subject to vulnerabilities, if you want enhanced security, please let us know uh, and you agree to pay for it. And in 10 years that I've had that provision in my engagement agreement on three occasions, the clients have come back and said, you know, we really do want enhanced security. Um, and of those three, in two, we were able to deploy security um, enhancements that benefited them without any cost. And in one, it was somewhat expensive, but it was a very unique client and they were happy to pay it. Um, the bar associations have encouraged that dialogue. I can't think of a better way to memorialize that dialogue, that you've had that dialogue, or at least raised and invited that dialogue with your clients than putting a paragraph in it like that. Um, and for any of you that I've worked with and have engaged me, you, you have that paragraph. It's the penultimate paragraph in our engagement agreement, um, but you already have it. If anyone else wants it, just shoot me an email offline and I'll send it to you and you can tweak it, tweak it or do with it what you so choose. 